Welcome to Inspire Campfire, a podcast where ordinary people tell their stories of extraordinary adventure. These are campfire stories meant to inspire the rest of us to light the fire within, get outside, follow our dreams, and return to tell our own stories. Ready? Let's strike the match. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Scott Wurzbacher. Today, we are going to hear wisdom from someone that knew what he wanted and used what he got to go after it. For today's guest, adventure was not only the goal, it was ultimately a side effect of a larger series of decisions. I have with me Ed Daniels, a retired science teacher from Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Now, back around the year 2000, Ed and his wife Nancy put several life pieces together to create a new life for themselves by forcing retirement on themselves, using what they had to make it happen, and then going on to experience 12 magical years of adventure in nature. There's so many lessons in what we're going to hear today, and I am personally ready to just soak up the conversation. Ed has been a lifelong fan of the active lifestyle. He enjoys running, hiking, biking, and sports. And in retirement, he's found himself doing more of what he loves, which includes playing guitar, photography, and writing. I'm so excited to have him with us today to share his story and hopefully give the rest of us some ideas that will intentionally help us serve our own futures. Ed, welcome to the campfire. Hi, Scott. Good to be with you. Oh, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm super excited. There's, uh, there's, there's just so much wisdom in, in, in <laughs> what I've learned from you so far. Um, I think I should probably start by just sharing that uh, that you and I were introduced through your son, Ed Daniels the Third, because many of my listeners know your son, and so when they see that we're doing an interview with Ed Daniels. They might be confused, so we're just gonna, we'll, we'll clear that up. So, so, so today we're going to learn uh, uh, the wisdom. Yeah. That I, I am the Ed Daniels that is the picture of Dorian Gray. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I love it. Well, um, awesome. Well, if you could just start by kind of just giving us a background of of who you are, where you are, and then we'll jump into this, you know, this kind of life story and 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 how you made this transition. Yeah, I'm the. Uh, you know, just just a regular guy. I really blush at the uh, at the notion that I am going to share wisdom with you. <laughs> we all but, have a story. Uh, yeah, you know, science teacher for uh, thirty three years. Um, loved it. It was a fantastic career for me. The perfect choice. Uh, I was learning my entire life. Uh, the last classes that I took, I was fifty. Um, nice. You know, always always changing. Uh, stride uh, when it comes to the science education part of it, um, you know, in my career, every five years I'd get a little bored with something and I'd uh, ask my administrators if I could start a new course and they were always willing to let me go and have my lead. So I taught things like um, oceanography, biotechnology, astronomy, um, Biology. My favorite was evolutionary bio or evolution biology. Nice. That was a particular interest for me. Chemistry. Uh, it was it was a very interesting career. And uh, likewise, uh, family has always been very important. I came from a large family, eight children, and we had three ourselves, Nancy and I. Uh, we have ten grandchildren now, wow. and they are a big part of our lives now as we settle in for the latter part of our our uh, experience and exploration in life. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and you're really enjoying it to the fullest. That we just are coming off a Thanksgiving holiday here, and uh, you had, I think, you had pretty much the whole family there with you. Yes, we did. Yeah. We did, and a few friends as well. Yeah. So, so this story is is so cool. You've had you had this this great career as a science teacher, um, but ultimately, a point came in your life where you put several puzzle pieces together. And, and the way that I saw this when you explained it to me was you sort of forced retirement on yourself. And the way that you did it was super unique. Um, the way you brought a couple of different pieces together. Um, one of those pieces involves real estate, which is, of course, uh, my day job. So that's always very intriguing to me of how you brought that into 
this overall goal. So for the listeners, can you just kind of talk to us about this, this major life decision that you made and how you brought multiple elements together to turn this thing into reality? Well, if, if there's anything that you learn by being a teacher is that you better have a plan and you better have a backup plan. Nice. And that's exactly what happened in the retirement planning. I mean, we started looking at retirement, talking about retirement in our 40s. Mm -hmm. uh, the vision was that we wanted to retire early, perhaps when I was about 60 years old, which would have maximized my retirement. Um, teachers don't make a, a boatload of money, um, but we scraped and scratched and uh, made some real estate investments, actually, uh, that paid off for us nicely. And uh, I worked every summer. If uh, not uh, painting houses, I was doing projects, major renovations around our own home, you know, save a little bit of money. So anyway, the pieces were coming together financially and we knew how much we needed to live with. Mm -hmm. uh, so there was a number there. Um, so we started putting it all together and said, yeah, all right, we need a certain percentage of my retirement income. Eventually social security kicks in. So the financials were a big part of the decision. Yep. Um, and then the state of Massachusetts and his eternal wisdom decided that they were going to try to retire some of the old higher paid teachers and gave us an extra five years of longevity in the retirement system. Bingo. <laughs> Can't turn that down. So, um, you know, we looked at what we needed. We looked at what we had. We looked at what how short we were and uh, decided that, you know, sell our, our first home, uh, move down the Cape into our vacation home and rent it in the summer as we traveled. And that we would use that income from the rental to yeah. pay for our trip and supplement uh, our income until Social Security kicked in and, uh, and we'd be fine. So we figured we had to do that for five years. Yeah. Nancy had just finished her banking career. Um, she, her bank had just been bought out by a, a larger bank and she was going to have to have a, a change in her, in her uh, 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 job. Mm -hmm. So uh, it looked like uh, the timing was good. And we decided <laughs> after checking with a financial planner, okay, everything's lining up. We can do this. Uh, and I think that, you know, the primary element in all of this is that we had, had not just anticipation, um, but we had a goal and we were very careful in, in making those plans that we'd be able to reach that goal, anticipating there would be some, uh, some hindrances. Yeah. So the thing that I really love about this, obviously bringing the real estate piece into this was that as you, as you kind of looked at this whole plan, um, you wanted to retire. The numbers weren't entirely there, but you had this home in a vacation community. Correct. And I think what you shared with me was that if we rent our house out over the summer, which is the busy season in that, in the Cape Cod area, mm -hmm. we can make enough money there to be able to complete this whole picture. Exactly right. So if we rent our house out for the summer, we can retire. Now that leaves a big question mark. <laughs> what do we do when we're renting out our house? Cause this is where we live. Yeah. So let's go there. What happens? Yeah. You know, I mean, all my life I've been studying interesting places uh, from my, you know, classroom position. Uh, and it was time for me to see that. Now we, we'd always been interested in uh, traveling and going places and, uh, we tried out a little camping uh, back in 1985 when the kids were just growing up mm -hmm. and it was a great experience. Uh, again, not everything went smoothly. <laughs> uh, interpersonal conflicts do occur uh, with any group of people that are forced together for a long period of time. But, the, you know, the kids absolutely considered it to be a life changing experience for them as well as myself. I wanted more of it just had to have more of it. And I found a great deal of solace in the wildness of nature. Yeah. Uh, room for thought, place to empty your head and let new ideas in. Um, 
you know, I had hobbies. My wife and I raised, raised a family. We were both working. Um, and frankly, we weren't spending a huge amount of time together for each other through most of our living and working lives. And uh, this was looked like an opportunity for us to uh, to get back together and focus on each other. Um, maybe it's force focused, but that's OK. I that love it. it. So 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 you guys are planners. So, OK, this first year, like we're going to rent our house out. Where are we going to do? Where are we going to go? Where are we going to sleep? Yeah, <laughs> exactly right. Uh, there was a long list. Um, Neither one of us particularly like uh, warm weather, so we weren't headed south. Okay. Although we did travel south at different times, but mostly our focus was north. We wanted to see more of Canada, uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, we loved the area around Acadia National Park. Yeah, it's beautiful. Yeah, it, uh, it just had so much to offer. Um, so yeah, we uh, bought a tent camper. That was a, that was a, 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 a compromise between tent camping, which I would have gone for, and hotel camping, which Nancy would have gone for. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't I wasn't averse to that idea at all. The idea of being in my 50s and sleeping on the ground was not very appealing. <laughs> so nice, yeah. so uh, having a bed off of the ground, a place mm -hmm. to have a cooler with a few beers in it, uh, sounded very attractive. <laughs> I love it. So you bought a temp, a tent camper, and this is one yeah. like a trailer, basically, that you're pulling behind you. Exactly. Yeah. So it was quite a rig. When we started out, we had a, uh, a, a GMC pickup truck with just one seat, you know, the front seat. Yep. Um, and uh, we had the, this Coleman, used Coleman camper. And uh, we shoved all our stuff in the back of the truck. We thought we were going to put the dog in the back of the truck, but... He didn't like that idea. So the dog rode cross country with us for years under Nancy's legs. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, we had to, we had to shake down crews, make sure everything was working. And of course uh, we had a plan for things not working. You know, we carried a toolbox and uh, we set out on see what would happen. Yeah. So, so the original plan was to do this for five years. Is that right? Yes, it was. Yeah. Five years we figured we had to commit to. Yeah. And that's, I think, where you came in with the idea of this being a forced retirement, <laughs> a forced retirement project. And I guess it was, but uh, it, it was something that we both wanted to do. And I was a little surprised that it took so little prodding to get Nancy to come along with that. Um, but she was very willing. Um, in fact, the, the rest of my family, uh, obviously had some conversations about our plans and decided that the over under for Nancy lasting in this whole thing was about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> she proved them wrong, huh? And as it turned out after 13 years, I was the one that pulled the plug on the project. Oh, wow. <laughs> she loved it. She did. So, she did. So in, the, in the early days, like, do you guys remember sort of like the moment that you decided, all right, we're doing this? It kind of crept up, Scott. It was yeah. uh, kind of always in the back of my mind, I suppose, uh, that that was one of the things I wanted to do in retirement, not necessarily this all in 75 days of summer thing. But um, yeah, it, it kind of crept in and I'd run the idea past Nancy and we'd consider alternatives and this one just stuck. So, yeah. well, you know, there's uh, the, the old, the, as a teacher, you probably remember this, the, the old story of the conquistador and I'm going to butcher his name, but Hernan Cortez in uh, 1519, he was invading the Aztec empire. And as the story goes, he was, he had 300 men with him. And uh, as they approached the coastline, he burned 10 of his 11 ships so that the men had no choice, but to go, inland and uh i'm reminded of that story because i'm sure you you signed a lease or you did something to say okay we're you know we're let some somebody else is moving into our house that we're essentially yeah. burning the ships and we're doing this like do yeah. you guys remember that moment and do you remember having any sort of fears or doubts like what did we do i you know i don't remember there being much in the way of fear and doubt it was anticipation that overwhelmed the whole idea uh, we were ready to go. And the amazing thing, Scott, was that 
Um, adventure wasn't necessarily a huge part of this. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was um, so much of it is interpersonal. Nancy and I met each other when we were teenagers. Mm -hmm. I was 17. She was 15. And we had not spent as much time together at any time in those uh, nearly 50 years before we started doing this camping thing. And it was wonderful. It was just wonderful. Nancy loved it. I loved it. You know, we'd play cards, we'd talk, we'd share the experiences we had during the day. I think it helped that we had different interests on these trips. Uh, so that we'd spend much, much of the day apart. And then we would get together in the evening for a meal and uh, talk about what happened. Can you can you go a little dive a little bit deeper into that? You said each of you guys had your own interests. So so mm -hmm. what were what were kind of your interests? What were her interests? How, yeah, how did so you guys do that? One of the things we carried along with us was uh, a canoe and later a kayak. Uh, I had we had bicycles. We had a tandem bicycle starting out with and ended up with uh, a couple other bicycles. Uh, fishing gear for me, hiking gear, GPS that kind of stuff, the thing you need to, to wander around in the woods. Yeah. And Nancy was into genealogy and it's a very time consuming project. And she was collecting a great deal of material and needed time to organize it. So these trips were uh, partly designed to give her the time to do that sort of thing. She would go to libraries, connect to the internet and uh, do some research and in the evening, she'd come back and let me know if she found any dead relatives. Nice. <laughs> That's very cool. Yeah. Meanwhile, I would share my photos and uh, tell her about my hikes and how Buddy or Monty and I uh, made out. Was, uh, my hiking companions were canine. Yeah. And uh, that's how it went for 75 days a year. Of course, obviously, there's the travel in between. And... That was always fun too. So, so this went on. So the original plan was to do this for five years, but obviously it went on for 12 or I think you even said 13. Yeah. Um, so, so what happened kind of at year five and, and how did, how did you end up doing this for 13 years? Just loved it. Absolutely loved it. Um, the better question I think is why did we stop? And, uh, and, and that's kind of, uh, it was a realization for us too. You know, when we were in our mid fifties, we were both healthy, mm -hmm. uh, uh, no problems getting around. Uh, I was always involved in sports in some way, shape or form. And, uh, you know, so in decent enough shape to do, to do some hiking all day, for example, or paddling or biking. Um, so, um, eventually what happened was that we started a breakdown with age. Uh, and, you know, we knew that the end was, was coming. It was getting harder and harder to leave the house. What used to take us three or four days to prepare the house for rentals was now taking us three weeks. Uh, and it was just getting, you know, we had medical issues that would needed to be taken care of that were sure. beginning to look like they might interfere. Sure. And eventually you got to the point where Nancy had stumbled on one of our trips and broken her foot. Mm. Uh, so more of the, uh, the tasks involved with the camping fell on me and I couldn't do it without her. Yeah. That was really tough. Yeah. So that was pretty much what um, took us out of the game, so to speak. So the, the point being here, and I think this is kind of an important one is that we do have a limited time. Uh, and it may not be time on this planet, but time to function in the way that we want to. And if you were given the option, let's say you're near death, a year away, how much would you pay to get an extra year mm. if it was offered to you? Mm. And the number is really high, but you can't buy back the time. Right. It's not about the money. It's right. not about the security. It's about taking advantage of the time that you have when you are ready to use it. Yeah. Here's, here's that wisdom that we're talking about yeah. there. There it is right there. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, um, that was I, perfect. There was, um, for me personally, there were yeah. basically three events that had me looking so hard at the early retirement. 
One was my dad died at 55 mm. without a day of retirement. One of my good friends died at 58, a uh, person that I worked with uh, that was just a tremendous human being, great guy, planned very, very well for his, uh, his retirement and died of pancreatic cancer at 58. Mm. I sat um, a few years before I retired, I sat with another coworker who I respected greatly, an English teacher. And as we sat in the auditorium, listening to some administrator drone on, uh, I asked her, you know, what she had planned for retirement. And she said, well, we'll probably fix up the house and travel for a few years. And then one or the other of us will get sick and we'll have to stay home for doctors. And my mouth dropped open. Yeah. I said, that's at 65. And you think about it. And that really is a pretty standard chronology yeah what what happens to people and i said shoot that's not nearly enough time for me yeah <laughs> i've got to go a lot a lot sooner than 65 so that's what the, my impetus was personally for the early retirement yeah i love it and so you took action and you know 12 you've got some great stories i i, I would love to just touch on this just comes to some of the stories just like over the course of 12 years um you know kind of broad brush where you went what you did um and maybe some of your favorite maybe some of your favorite highlights or memories that you've had boy there's a lot there yes i know <laughs> um you know, and uh, once you invited me for the podcast, Scott, I decided to go back and take a look at some of my pictures and journals, uh, which uh, I wrote on, on most of my trips. And uh, it was just a delight to go back and look over those things. We, we, we traveled, as I said, 75 days or so a summer and probably stayed in 20 different places over the course of that time. Uh, so there were, there were a lot of locations, but there were a few that were of, of particular impact to me personally. Um, and we decided to go back to some of those. But um, one of the things I decided to do was I in intend to be, uh, not to be morbid, but I do intend to be cremated. Okay. Donated my, oh, by the way, I'm, I'm going to Harvard Medical School when I die. Nice. Uh, donated my body. <laughs> nice. Okay. So I will be cremated. And uh, uh, a friend had this idea. So it's, I won't lay claim to this myself personally. But uh, we've decided to create bags of Ed. I'm going to give people a bag of my ashes. And I want them to be delivered to different places that were of great significance to me personally, that inspired me, that made me think, that made me love nature even more <laughs> and uh, experience it for themselves. So it was going to be their gift to me to deliver the ashes and my gift to them to deliver them to these places. So we have our, our places for the bags of it. But first of all, I'm just getting chills listening to you this. Like, yes, it's morbid, but at the same time, like there's a great joy in this. It is, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. So one of the places is not a place we camped, but did visit the uh, Scottish Highlands. Surprisingly, uh, now we found out, I found out late in life that I was Scott. Okay. And uh, we visited the Highlands and it, it just strangely and oddly felt like home. It was the oddest thing. I uh, took a particular hike in the, uh, uh, oh, what is it? The Cargorns National Park okay. in the Highlands. And uh, just, just, it was just one of those, in, in, in walk along and your feet squish into the moss and release some water as you're walking. And there were the sounds and the smells and the, the air. It was really unique. Uh, I met a I met, I met a young man up there at the at the peak, uh, and we sat there and told stories for over an hour, sitting there in the in the shadow in the lee side of this huge carn that was up there, 
Uh, and he told me stories about Scotland and where he lived and what he did. It was, it was just an amazing experience. So we have the Scottish Highlands. So real quick, you mentioned like you had this odd feeling that you were at home. I just wonder, can you like explain that a little bit deeper? Um, like what that feeling felt like? Wow. This, there was, there was a quiet joy in it. Um, it was a feeling that, that didn't come from anything necessarily physical but seemed to rise up from the whole area, the view, the sound, the smell, um, were all a little part of it, but somehow it, there, were, there were voices singing. <laughs> I don't know, it was that kind of thing. Like, yeah. I know there was no sound being made, but there was just something about it that, uh, it, it's, uh, it's kind of otherworldly. It's literally, literally inspirational yeah that's what and there were more than one place like that there's a word that i love talking uh, bringing up on this podcast it's the word awe and the the dictionary definition is a reverential respect mixed with fear and wonder and i'm curious if that's a little bit of what you felt <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah absolutely yeah i yeah. love that Fear, All right, so, fear and wonder. I, you know that that's a that's a really odd mix, mix, Scott, but it is absolutely dead on. It seems that those places that you love the most have to be tainted with a little bit of fear, uh, and I would call it awe more than fear. But I don't know, risk. Yeah, maybe there's something in that an element of risk that's involved that just heightens the senses to that to that kind of inspiration. Yeah, I think there's a smallness that you feel when you're out in nature and you're just kind of exposed to the elements and the wild. And, you know, I think that's where it wells up in me a little bit. Yeah. All right. So what's on the list? Where did we yes. go? So it's we went to the like, Scottish Highlands. What are a couple of other uh, yeah. other highlights? There's a, a place in Maine, in down east Maine, called Cop Copscook Bay. Quietest place I have ever been in my life. A um, couple of trips out there, love being out on the water. There's about a 20 foot tide out there. So you literally ride this river of water as it washes in and out of the bay. Um, and here's your element of awe and fear. Yeah. <laughs> when you're riding the tide and you know there's a waterfall, literally a waterfall at one end. Wow. <laughs> it does keep you keep your attention. <laughs> But you know, it was just it was just so fun. Uh, one of the things that that I noticed in that trip was first, it feels like cotton in your ears. But secondly, the sounds travel over the water from a mile away that sound like they're ten feet away. Mm. I literally could hear the one inch long glass shrimp jumping out of the water. Wow! Yeah, it was it was just a great experience. I love that that just you said that it was the quietest place you've ever been, and I that just that struck me when you said that. Yeah, there was um, I was out paddling around. The dog was sleeping in the canoe, and uh, I, I'm just lazily paddling more more to make uh, my body move than to actually get anywhere. And I hear this, and I thought. I know that sound. And I look behind me and about 25 feet away is this big old horsehead seal. And it kept creeping itself closer and closer, taking a look at me and the dog <laughs> paddling along in his, in his space. <laughs> and I've never gotten so close to a seal in my life. Uh, now I've seen plenty of seals, but somehow this one, that seemed to be following us and inspecting us seemed to be enjoying the ride as much as I was. I, you know, I, and I'd love that your dog was, was out there with you. Cause I, somehow I find like that seals tend to be like the dogs of the ocean. Mm -hmm. Like they just have this sort of puppy playful energy and they're just sort of curious and they kind of come like, there's just, just something about a seal that reminds me of, of dogs as a companion. Yeah. Yep. True enough. Yeah. I love yeah. it. 
So you sent me a bunch of pictures and we'll definitely put a bunch of them in the show notes that I, you know, I definitely noticed a whole bunch of pictures in, um, look to be the Canadian Rockies. Yes. Um, yeah. And just some beautiful mountainscapes. Yeah. Yeah. So all time favorites, um, the Canadian Rockies are not to be missed. I don't care how you travel, train, bus, car, hike it, camp it. You, it's it's got to be on everybody's life list yeah. it's just the most stunning and inspirational place that uh, i have ever been uh bar none uh and in terms of what it's meant for me uh there was just some some of the most amazing hikes i mean many of these hikes were above the ice line so you'd be up there and uh you know ten thousand feet looking down onto the glaciers as you're hiking along past the sign that says trail ends here <laughs> and just keep going. Yeah. yeah. No, no way to get lost. Mm, yeah. There was a way a little <laughs> yeah. Bit <of> here. <laughs> yeah. I, I, we, to the moment. we did a trip out to the Canadian Rockies at one point. And one of the biggest things I remember, and this kind of goes to your love of photography. I found out there that, you know, no matter what I did, I couldn't take a picture that captured the essence of what you see when you're there in person. Yeah. I wonder as a photographer, how you, how you experienced that. Yeah. It's, it's more of a prod than it is a representation. It, it, it cues you into what the experience was like to see the place again. Uh, and it, I think they're absolutely necessary to do that. Uh, Interesting thing that I that I discovered about uh, neuroscience is uh, in, in the study of memory. Our memories are not solid. Our brains are uh, very plastic, and our memories change and fade and are reshaped every time we think of a place, every time we think of a person or an event. We recreate the memory mm. in a new form, and. Pictures are a way of holding on to the original memory that a memory without that kind of substance uh, just doesn't have. So when I take the pictures, they're there really just to bring me back to a closer touch to the place than I had later on. I love that so much. We had uh, a guest on the show many episodes ago, Mr. Bill Barty. And, uh, and he told me that somebody once told him that an adventure is 80% anticipation, 20% recollection, and a dose of reality. And, <laughs> and it's true. I mean, that, you know, the trip itself. Oh, you've been reading my, my journals, have you? <laughs> oh, you, said, you said it too. You, maybe you were the one that said it to him. Um, but I think what you're talking about with the pictures is the recollection piece. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Trying, trying to capture yeah. that. So let's so go. There. Let me tell you about. Let me tell you about two of my uh, my experiences in the Canadian Rockies, and there were there were so many more, but two in particular. One was um, I, was, I was headed off on a hike from uh, what I think they call the tallest falls in the Canadian Rockies, the Tataka Falls, and uh, it bordered on Yoho National Park in Canada. It's okay. part of that whole necklace of. Uh, fantastic Canadian national parks, uh, including Banff and Jasper and a few others. Anyway, Yoho, uh, I started out in probably my favorite name for a river of, of all time, the Kicking Horse Pass, so the Kicking Horse River. I thought that was awesome. So we start off from the Kicking Horse River, and I'm going over the Burgess Path to um, a lake, Emerald Lake. Now, Burgess is the home of Burgess Shale. And for an evolution biologist, this is holy ground. Okay. This is where they found some of the oldest fossils on the planet. Uh, so here I was going to climb over this uh, pass and uh, get down to this beautiful alpine lake. And Nancy was gonna meet me, meet me there because the lake did have uh, road access. So uh, the pass contained uh, 55, or 50, 58 switchbacks. Pretty rugged climb. That's a lot. <laughs> yeah. Several thousand feet in elevation. Yeah. 
Yeah. And at 58, uh, that was significant for me. Mm -hmm. 58 pass, 58 switchbacks at 58 years old. Yes. So with each switchback, I went back in time. Oh, wow. I marked each switchback with a year of my life and reflected on it as I walked along. It was just miraculous. It was just so fun remembering the people, the places, and mostly the people, the stories, the events of my life as I went up there uh, to take a look at uh, some of this Burgess Shale. Now, the element of awe and fear. <laughs> I climb out onto a ledge that had exposed shale. And I'm up there tapping away at the rock and breaking some of it open, not really expecting to find anything. It's been worked way more than I could ever uh, uh, do it. So I'm up on this bridge and I, I decide I'm going to peek over the top of the ridge. And there is Emerald Lake down below me. Just mm -hmm. absolutely beautiful. But um, I can't see the cliff below me. So I finally decided it's, uh, it's not the best place in the world to be. So I, I start climbing down and I look back at where I was. And on top of this broken shale, I see that it's completely undercut about 10 feet under where I was laying down, playing with the rocks. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Another another hike that I took was um, um, called the Ice Fields Trail. No, yeah, the Ice Fields Trail. Okay. Started out in the fog, couldn't see a thing. Uh, just get onto the trail and start hiking up, and up about 500, 600 feet of elevation, I start pushing through the clouds, and there below me is a cloud bank. Through the breaks in the cloud bank, I can see the falls. And above me are these jagged mountains from the Selkirk Range in the Canadian Rockies. Just magical. What a place. Virtually no one else around as far as the eye could see until we get to that point where I think you have a picture of it. Two hikers off, in the, off on the ridge uh, to give the, the image some perspective. But uh, another great experience of uh, hiking in the Rockies and the feeling of isolation and and smallness. Yeah, I just love the, love the feeling of perspective that I get when I'm out in the wild. It makes you feel small. It makes you feel um, I don't know relevant somehow uh, that you're spying like a fly on the wall. You're it's spying awesome. on the yeah. world. And I think that's some of the the awe, right? It's that yeah. it's that feeling of smallness. I like I can't help but think like I'm just kind of visualizing you out there, um, and I want to ask you like what happens to you when when you're out there. But I like what I'm getting from you is you're taking these physical adventures, and then you're bringing into it like an element of introspection, like this this whole idea of the 58 switchbacks at age 58 and what you did while you were out there. I mean, that you must have known in advance that there was 58 switchbacks, like, okay, I'm going to do this. At the trailhead. At the trailhead. So, but the, I love, like, I love the bringing together of this, you know, the introspection with this physical adventure. And it's just sort of this, this sort of blending. Um, and I just, I wonder if you could just kind of talk about that. Like what, you know, what, what happens to you when you're out in nature? Yeah, that's really an important, important thing. Um, we spend all of our working lives uh, planning and and uh, anticipating and concentrating on getting things done, getting things done well, getting things done right. And being out in the wild, like on these hikes alone, and I think it really helps to be alone, is that you can let your mind be just wander, become blank somehow. And it becomes open to different thoughts. Um, sometimes those, those moments would be filled with an earworm and I'd be, I'd have a song in my head yeah. as I'm marching along on the trail. <laughs> and other times I, I see something, something on the ground, a rock, uh, an insect, a leaf, and it would just push my brain off in that direction for a few minutes and it would just float and flow. And eventually you come through with, um, with some really interesting thoughts and ideas that 
oh yeah, this connects to that and this connects to that. And, and you start putting pieces together unintentionally that, um, that create a painting as you hike. Mm, I love that. Create a painting as you hike. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I love that. You know, um, in some of the conversations that we had actually first conversation with your son and I, all three of us were on a call. We talked a little bit about just like, um, concepts of spirituality and some different like things that you've studied academically, um, including Joseph Campbell's hero's journey, which we talk a lot about on, on this podcast. Oh, yeah. Um, but you know, it, it seemed to me that like at a spiritual level, I think you said that you feel sort of most connected with yourself, like out when you're out in nature. Yeah. Uh, it, um, you know, it, aren't we all taking a journey, right? I mean, uh, uh, what was it Whitman that said that, um, you know, the, uh, oh no, it wasn't Whitman, excuse me. It was Thoreau that said that, uh, life is a stream. Uh, there's a, there's a stream bed that doesn't change. That's us. Um, but water is always changing. It's all about the journey of the water through the stream bed. And that's kind of what, um, what it's like uh, putting these pieces together. I think uh, studying science was a true blessing for me. Uh, it, it gave me the idea that, that so much of our world is connected in ways that I think most, most people don't have that gift. Yeah. Um, you know, from the molecular level, how molecules interact with each other to uh, how evolution has come to, uh, to create such a huge diversity of life you know, everything from slime mold to human beings share so much, so much. We have so much in common. It's crazy. <laughs> uh, and to see how these things have all adapted. Another thing is the, the whole idea that, you know, another idea that came into my the pinnacle of life, human beings, the pinnacle of life, God's greatest creation. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't buy it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I look at the things around me and go, that bird can sit in that cold water all year long without a coat, <laughs> without a wetsuit. I can't stay out here for an hour. Yeah. <laughs> and it gained such respect for yeah. other living things and how they've interacted with the planet and their environment. Uh, it's, it's really in, such an enlightening experience to, to focus on those things and let your mind drift off in that direction. Yeah, I love that. And I think that you're your background in science, I mean, I'm sure that it's, it's contributed to this whole experience. And, and so I, I, I do kind of want to, uh, before we run out of time here, I, I do want to kind of touch on this idea of, you know, like your career as a science teacher, and then this transition into retirement. And I'm just curious, like sort of for the listeners, like, if you've experienced any sort of shift, like from a mindset standpoint, from from sort of those working years, into retirement, into this whole experience of the adventures that you went on and, and maybe how your sort of mindset has, has changed or transformed during that time. And, and, you know, kind of in line with this whole idea of the hero's journey. Yeah. The, it, in, in the working years, you're raising kids, you want, you want success, you want results, you want, you want good kids. Uh, so you, you're working hard at that, focusing on them and you're working hard at your job. You want success there. You want to be secure financially. You want to be appreciated. Uh, you want to do a job well, uh, to be successful that makes you happy. But I actually, in retirement, things got a little bit more selfish, I think in a way. Now I can focus on myself, a couple of people you know, family, close friends. Um, and you, you've gained a perspective on where your place is in that whole uh, dynamic. So, um, yeah, it's very different. Uh, I feel much more relaxed in retirement, uh, not just because there were so many pressures in the job, but just with my own, with myself, with my my own view of life, uh, my own position uh, within the family, my own value with uh, with my wife and how, how I value her. 
are all things that I've been able to focus on a lot more in retirement. Yeah. And so, you know, in my, again, in my exposures with you, the last couple of calls that we've had, like I sense a deeply philosophical person. And I'm curious if, have you always been that way? Is that something that's evolved? I have, but I haven't always had the time for it. Okay. Frankly, uh, I, I was surprised and fascinated uh, when I went to college and uh, got a chance to study some philosophy and theology. I went to 16 years of parochial schools. <laughs> Not bad for an atheist, huh? <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, I, I just always been interested in it. I, I feel as though I was always a pilgrim. You know, what is the truth? And I had this, this basic skepticism for religion and blind faith um, that, that, I, that I transitioned through. I mean, I was a devout Catholic for quite a number of years into my adulthood, too. Raised our kids in the church and so forth and, and took great solace in the, uh, the ceremonies and the, uh, uh, just, the, just the community community in general. Um, but uh, then again, I had to keep looking and looking. There was something that was still not right with organized religion for me. Mm -hmm. Now, what Joseph Campbell has done for me is enlightened me about the value of these other points of view. And I, at this point in my life, I totally respect that. The whole idea here is for us to be happy in our lives. That's the ultimate goal. Uh, and if, if religions and blind faith and, uh, service to God is, uh, is what makes you happy, that is absolutely what, what you should be doing. Uh, it was a different path for me and I just hope people can respect that too, but I find, uh, a, a different point of view, uh, still gets me to the same place. I, I appreciate nature. I please. I, I appreciate my place in nature and uh, that brings me solace and ha happiness. It I makes love, sense to me. It just makes sense to me. Yeah. I love that wisdom. And, you know, you said that um, the different views all get us to the same place. And this is what Joseph Campbell is talking about. His book is called the hero with a thousand faces, which is yeah. essentially yeah. You know, there's, there's many different heroes. We're all wearing different masks. We all have different circumstances and we're all kind of headed for And them. even different within our own lives. Yeah. Right. Isn't it, isn't it reminiscent of reincarnation? Yeah. In a way, you're not the same one you were when you, person you were when you were a child. Yeah. You're not the same person you were when you were working. You know, it's, it, it we, we become reincarnated with our own, within our own lifetime. We, do. we, we, we have our own hero's journey that starts at birth and ends at death. And then there's multiple hero's journeys that happen along the way. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So cool. Well, you know, one of the things I discovered, Scott, uh, when I was going through my journals and uh, my son was enlightened enough to save some of my email stories that uh, I sent out to them when I was traveling and he put them together in a, a, a homemade book uh that that i call um sunset in the rearview mirror nice and uh going through them i came upon one the other day in particular that i decided i, I wanted to share again with uh, my daughter and my wife okay so just yesterday we were going through this this journal and uh this one I call the uh, the secret of life, and I I wonder if I could take a moment just to read a little passage from it. Yes, please, I love that. So we were we were uh, accidentally camping in Makashika State Park in Montana. This is in the southeast corner of Montana. It's the Badlands. Yep, and we'd not been there before. Always pretty much uh, intentionally avoided it because it didn't seem like there was anything there. So we, we finally get into this place and it is empty. We travel for three miles from the entrance to the camping area and see no one. 
we get into the camping area and in 50 some odd sites that are in there, there is no one. We're wondering what's wrong with this place. <laughs> so um, we finally just, you know, pick a spot. Weather's beautiful. It's it's hot, but it's dry. Uh, and uh, we're, we go to bed and the wind picks up and the wind picks up and the wind picks up and our tent camper is flamp, flapping all over the place. So we have very interrupted sleep here. Then we see these lights uh, flash across the hills behind us. And then they sweep our camper and go around again and again. And in our sleep stupor, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, what are we being invaded by aliens? <laughs> and the next morning we wake up and there next to us, right next to our camper, is a caravan. I said, great, these alien beings travel through <laughs> countless miles of uh, light years of space and they're traveling in a caravan. So out pops, oh man, out pops uh, this little old man uh, and this uh, little old woman, Dallas and Leo. Turns out that they've been married for 63 years. They've been high school sweethearts, were married as teenagers, and were retired since Leo was in his mid-50s. Any of this sounding familiar? Yeah. They came to visit Cody, Wyoming for their 28th visit. 28. They traveled in, not their spaceship, not a truck camper, a tent, or a mobile home, but a caravan. Well, in talking to Dallas and Leo, we come to find out that uh, I have a lot of questions for them. I said I became utterly resigned to listen to listen to them and hope that somewhere my questions could be answered. What is the secret to staying together for so long? How did you cope with marriage and children? And, and uh, as not much more than children yourself. What have you done to keep retirement interesting? What have been your greatest hurdles? How can you travel and why? What the hell do you camp in a caravan for? <laughs> As their words poured out, it became white noise. There was a second telling of the story about the drug addict grandson who took advantage of them. There's the $3 racket Kmart story and the list of fun things they do at Walmart. It eventually dawns on me that the details of the stories are not the answers. It's how the story is being told. Leo's self-effacing and defers constantly in his reliance to Dallas. Somehow you begin to sense that that is, that it is she who needs Leo. Despite the frail body and gentleness, he keeps them from folding under the pressures of nine medicines a day and each family crisis, stretching money and their mental fitness. Dallas busies herself tending the daily needs, and Leo warns her to work less and limps around on his two bad hips as he, as he tries to help. There's no complaining, only two people trying to find their way to help each other. Dallas starts a story and gives Leo a cue to finish because it makes me too upset. Leo takes over for a line or two before Dallas, now recovered, gets to complete the tale. The transition is seamless. They both smile easily, laugh at the parts of the story that they have doubtless heard and laughed at a thousand times before. For two days, our adopted alien companions pour their conversations on us. My questions go unasked, but within the blanket coverage of their verbiage from these simple, wise, and ancient beings, the answers come. You can always make do with less if you do it with good cheer. Laugh a lot, especially at yourself. Take joy in the things that you like and damn the opinion that Kmart sucks. <laughs> do what you have to do, do your best, and move on. Not everything is your fault or in your control. Be joyful. Take care of each other. I finished reading that last night again. <laughs> and the three of us were 
covered in tears. <laughs> it just had so much more meaning reading it now than when I wrote it. I don't know. What was it? 20 years ago? 15 yeah. years ago? I'm thinking that now, needs, that needs to be in a public. We are Dallas and Leo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing, and that that needs to be in a book for other people to read. That th this is incredible. I love that you just shared that, and I hope that you'll share that with even more people. Um, I would love to get my hands on those journals. <laughs> <laughs> this is incredible. You know, I always um, before I do my two fun questions, I usually finish with what advice do you have for people? You just shared it with Dallas and Leo's story. So thank you so yeah. much for that. I really appreciate it. And, yeah. you know, Ed, this has been such an epic journey for you. And at some point, Hollywood's going to find out about <laughs> your story and they're going to want to make a movie about you and these 12 years of, of adventures that you've taken. So I want to know, uh, before we wrap up here, who's going to be the Hollywood actor that's going to play you in your movie? Oh, wow. Well, you know, I think maybe it could be Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks, he, yeah. He just somehow has that sensitivity and wonder about him. Um, could be Jimmy Stork, but I don't think he's around much anymore. So <laughs> <laughs> okay. there you go. I love it. And what's your movie going to be called? Uh, second Best Decision. Ooh, Second Best Decision. Okay. Yeah. This early retirement was the sex, second best decision I ever made. All right. And the first one occurred when... I asked somebody to dance when I was 17 years old. I love that so much. That was awesome. Ed, thank you so much for being here and sharing all this wisdom with us today. And for those listening, I hope you've been inspired today as much as I have. I hope Ed's story has encouraged you to listen to the voice inside that calls you to adventure because we want to hear your story next. If you have a story to tell or need a nudge to create one, please send me an email. We'd also appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word by leaving a review and sharing or tagging Inspire Campfire in your social media. And until next time, I want to encourage you to get outside. Thank you for listening. Ed, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for letting me relive my trip. It was awesome. <laughs>